Welcome engineers, my name is Travis IQ and today we're securing layer 2, specifically port security and 802.1x. Let's figure this stuff out. Security now, Jerry! Okay, so we're back in the void to discuss security, specifically layer two security at the switch. And there are a bunch of things that you can do at the switch from a security perspective, right? You can do things like DHCP snooping, dynamic ARP inspection, layer three switches have a lot of additional functionality, but we're gonna talk about two components and two that I think actually get a little mixed up. And that is port security and port-based authentication. So port security and port based auth, right? Port based authentication. And specifically there's uh, one in here that I'd like to talk about, which is 802.1x. This is really, a very, this is, you know, very common. I think it's probably the, the primary port based authentication mechanism that we would talk about in something like uh, CCNA. And so now let's talk about these two differences here and they are distinctly different. Although you might think to yourself, I think a lot of people see port based authentication and think like, well, that's a mechanism of port of securing ports, right? And I agree, but it's not port security. And so port security specifically, you hear, you hear this term used in the context of MAC address filtering really. And this makes a lot of sense as to why we would do this filtering, why we would do this at the switch. Switches, layer two devices, look at layer two addresses, specifically media access control addresses in this case. And you can filter based upon those addresses. If you think about it, if you had a switch and you had a server connected to that switch, I could bind right, a single MAC address to this switch port, and I could say it's the, switch, the, the MAC address of this server, whatever it is, AD colon 55 C3 and so on and so forth to get to my 48-bit MAC, right? And I could bind this to that port and say, if you see anything other than this, in the Cisco world, right, this, is putting the, this will actually put the port in an error disabled state disabled and so what that does is it sh effectively shuts the port down now error disabled and sh administratively shut down are two are two different things slightly but in this case if we're talking about securing the port it's effectively shut down and so this is based upon a single mac address and so what i could do is i could statically assign a mac address and i could force the port the switch port to do to to look at it right from a port security perspective and if i saw anything other than that mac address i could shut the port down so that's one way to do it if i knew that i had a server or a printer or something specific hanging off that port this is very common for switch security is if i was if there is something hanging off that port that i that i know is doing a, a specific function right i know it's doing dhcp for example i can configure that port as a trusted port for a dhcp server i can look at other ports and you know, dynamically filter based upon our broadcast and things like this so it, it, it's very common to do this on a port by port basis. Now, it's not as effective to do it on a port by port basis for you know a, a 4,000 user environment and every host that's connected or every host that's connected to a wireless access point or something like this. So we need something that's a little bit more dynamic and that would be something like port based auth. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to that in just a second. So there's another thing that we can do here um, with MAC address filtering and port security, which is I can actually have it dynamically learned. So this was static. Right, I had I had these statically assigned. I can also have these things dynamically learned. And dynamic means actively learning instead of having them statically assigned by me. I can say, hey, switch, you learn this stuff. One of the ways to do that, for example, in the Cisco world is by saying uh, MAC address sticky, right? Um, sometimes you'll hear people call this sticking MAC addresses to interfaces. And so it's sticking a MAC address to an interface or more than one. You could do this on a trunk port or you could do it on a port connected to a wireless access point. And you could say, we're gonna have you know up to 25 hosts connected to this interface. And so I could go up to 25 MAC addresses stuck to an interface. And so in this case, let's say if I were doing it something like this, that, right? And now I could say, okay, right? If I see more than a certain number of uh, MAC addresses or maybe something more like, let's do something more like this, right? Where I go, switch to switch, right? Where this is, this would be known as a trunk port, probably. 
right? In a multi VLAN environment, which we would almost always have. So we've got a trunk board here, and I would expect to have, you know, a certain number of a certain number of MAC addresses. And if I felt like, right, maybe somebody maliciously hopped on here and was doing some MAC address flooding to try and flood an environment, for example, then I would actually administratively shut this port down, right, and turn off. Now, there's, this is some weird example because you might not want to administratively error disable a trunk port, but I'm giving you some mixed examples here. The other thing about this is you might be saying to yourself, one of the classic things that I hear when we when we discuss this type of topic is, well, Travis, can't I just change my MAC address if I were an attacker? If I were to, right, we're trying to secure the infrastructure. If I were to plug in here, right, if Jan were plugged in here and then I had, you know, hacker Y plug in instead, couldn't I just look at Jan's MAC address and spoof Jan's MAC address, spoof her source and become Jan? Yes. I can. And that's relatively simple. I mean, there are some issues with that, right? I still have to know Jan's source source Mac. So it is more secure than just being able to plug in directly. And my argument would be that it, although it is moderately easily bypassable, right? It adds a layer of security. It makes it tougher to facilitate this by plugging it, physically plugging into this device and gaining access to the system. And so my argument, my counter argument to that most of the time is, well, you know, if you locked your front door, someone could kick your front door in too, but you but you don't just leave your front door unlocked, for example, right? So we're securing physical ports in this case. And so that's that's my counter argument. And, and there's actually a, a terminology associated with this too, right? It's called the fence in depth. D and, D and D for you nerds out there, right? And so, you know, this is this is a component of defense in depth. Okay, so here's our here's our easy version, port security. And then we have our tougher version, and I'm going to go into some more depth about 802.1x when I do an 802.1x specific video, and we'll do some like setup of port security and port based auth too in subsequent videos. But for now, let's let's talk about it from a comparison perspective. So, what's the primary differences, let's say, between port security and port based authentication? Well, port based authentication actually takes the host that signs in on that port and forces them to authenticate. Right? And so authentication is different than just checking a MAC address. Authentication is actually you proving your identity. And so usually with authentication, you're gonna, port, you're gonna pass a username and password. So when Jan logs in here, on a port by port basis, I'm going to force authentication on this user. And we do this in wireless environments too, where your wireless access point is essentially a switch that's listening right, for communication. It works a little bit differently with you know, multiple channels and whatnot and sat band saturation and distances because it's not finite like a wired infrastructure is. But regardless, right, Jan connects and Jan go and the switch goes, hey, I need some creds. I need to authenticate you. And so what's the what's the switch acting like? The switch is acting like the bouncer here, right? And specifically, it's actually in 802.1x, it's known as the authenticator. Authenticator. And Jan says, oh, okay, all right, yeah, I got you. And Jan says, uh, you know, I'm Jan and my password is Jan1. And the switch takes those credentials and sends them out to an authentication server. And so that's, this is what 802.1x is defining. When you tell a switch, hey, we're going to do in the Cisco world dot one X, what you're actually saying is, hey, we are going to do, we are going to do this. You're gonna need a, you're gonna need a server. You're going to need to be listening for authentication protocols and you're going to need to be passing that information to this authentication server. And so I can give you some quick examples here, but this is, it's obviously different from a, an inf infrastructure perspective than port security. And specifically, uh, one, one last thing, what is, what is Jan called in this infrastructure? This is, this is a nice quiz question, especially if you're taking, let's say something like a Security Plus or a CCNA, is Jan, is Jan in, in 802.1x, in the RFC, the definition for 802.1x, Jan is known as the supplicant. This is the person trying to authenticate. Supplicant passes information to the authenticator. The authenticator transmits that authentication credentials to the authentication server. The server looks them up and says yay or nay, right? And there's actually a response. It's accept, reject, challenge. And so you know this. Yes, you're accepted. No, you're rejected. Or hey, I need more information. What's the last, what's the middle name of your first dog when you were 15 years old? I don't know, whatever it is. And so from an implementation perspective, 
a, a brief introduction here is the way that we pass this information from device to device. They're called authentication protocols. And so that's how it's actually encapsulated on the wire. And usually these authentication protocols are gonna end with an AP authentication protocol. And so you see these password authentication protocol, challenge handshake authentication protocol, the extensible authentication protocol, EEP is a great one, PAP, CHAP, EEP. EEP is a very common protocol used to exchange authentication information in 802.1x environments. There you go. If you're looking for examples of EEP, there are some great EEP packet captures on, on packetlife.net or these other places. I'll, I'll link some of this stuff in the, in the show notes. And the servers themselves, these are called AAA servers, authentication, authorization, and accounting servers. Specifically what they're doing here for us is authenticating. And a very common server used in these infrastructures is known as a RADIUS server. The remote authentication dial-in user service. RADIUS server. It's dial-in user service server. And so this is port-based authentication in a nutshell, help, help, I'm in a nutshell, and compared to something like port security, which is filtering MAC addresses. Both are at the switch port and they are facilitating security and determining whether that user should have access. One is based upon MAC address, either dynamically or statically learned, and one is based upon authentication credentials, which are then passed to a server that has that authentication information. You could also do this locally. Travis, why wouldn't I do this locally? If, we, if we're thinking these three things through, I gave you an example of, of MAC address filtering and how we could bypass these things. Why wouldn't I do this locally? Why wouldn't I hold all the credentials on the switch? Two reasons. One, right, switches aren't built for this. So if you had a lot of credentials, then it's gonna be really computationally intensive or memory intensive on the switch. And then you'd have to hold all those credentials on each switch for every user if they were to plug in somewhere else. And two, switches are at, they're at the access layer. They're at the very edge of your network. So you probably don't wanna be holding all of these user credentials, all these authentication credentials, right at the box that's at the very edge of your network. It's gonna be very hard to secure all of those boxes and all of those credentials that are everywhere. So why don't we centralize the credential management, right? And then we can use the edge devices to query that centralized management service. And so this AAA server holds all that information and the switches were they to be compromised or moved or stolen or whatever because they sit at the edge of my network, for example, I'm just thinking of physical examples. That's what that's where we're actually gaining a, a security advantage um, over let's say a local a local login as opposed to these authentication servers being used in, in an 802.1x environment. Right? So we could force local logins as well, but it would be a little bit different and I would say it would be uh, reduced security, increased overhead, increased management burden, increased memory utilization. And so you think of there's a lot of negative for not a whole lot of positives there. That being said, I think that we've sufficiently compared the two. As is always the case, engineer, break stuff, have fun, stick around. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna post a demo after after this thing gets posted a couple of days or a week later. So.